Okay, um, Jojola Pasaka Sita. Uh, good evening, everyone. So today we have Mr. Daya Shakya as our guest speaker. Um, so Daya Shakya sir is a linguist. He earned his postgraduate degree in linguistics, Nepalese language and literature with special focus on Nepali and Nepal Vasa from the University of Oregon, USA and Tribune University in Kathmandu, Nepal. So he currently resides in Oregon where he teaches Khas Nepali and Nepal Vasa to American students as well as students from other parts of the world. Uh, we're really, really excited to have him here. We also had him last year uh, in our first session uh, as one of our guest speakers and we have him again here today. So uh, we'd like to thank him for that. And today he'll be speak, uh, speaking on, um, he'll be talking about uh, contemporary features of Nepal Vasa. So um, I'd like to uh, request this or to proceed with his talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sadiqa. So I'm here to give you some structural analysis of Nepal Vasa, how you have learned and how we can you know, uh, keep forward, going forward. Definitely, my lecture is not like a, speaking just by myself. I would like to see an interaction between the participants and also the you know uh, give some feedback every you know few minutes. So that's my way. Of, that's my way of uh, uh, lecturing. And I see only uh, the people here is uh, Supriya Manandar, Vishnu Chitrakar, Kumar Shrestha, Anurup Golabani, and Jeevan. Tresta and Nandita Pradhan. Uh, welcome to the uh, lecture uh, in my lecture. Sometimes, you know, I just wake up you know, a few minutes ago, so I'm, I was not quite ready to be here. <laughs> so, but anyway, so slowly, slowly, I will charge my battery to speak up in a full speed. So that's my, how I, it goes. So I'm speaking from Oregon. Uh, right now in my uh, the place is uh, uh, 6.41 time in the morning. So a little bit early, early today than usual time for me to come forward at the, to the lecture. Mostly I teach it in the evening time, my time and the morning time in Nepal. So 11 hour and 45 minutes, you know, I am a little bit you know, back. So that's what we are, you guys are have a evening time. I would like to say good evening to all. And I don't see who are here because if you could, you know, turn the vent, uh, you know, turn the camera on, so I will have some, you know, uh, I will have some, some. Let's see who are here and who are not here. Definitely looks like uh, Nandita is here, Jivan is here, and Kumar. I don't see Kumar, and I don't see Anurup. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope uh, four of them are students uh, in this group. So definitely. Uh, Kumar Badu, camera on in this night. Andrew Badu. Kumar, come go camera on in this Anybody here? I, the the group says the nine people. Yeah, I see the nine nine over here. So including uh, Sadicha and the Tis Nebarwasa, who is leading that Tis Nebarwasa. Okay, hello, Namaste, Josulopa. So these are the three words: Namaste, Josulopa, and. For me is good morning and for you is good evening. So definitely, you know, I give you a small scenario. In one company, if the people come six o'clock in the morning and then the, they work for the eight hours and then they leave around 2.30. So, and the, another group come in at the two o'clock and they leave around in a eight hour shift. And then the person, you know, meet at the morning, that's six o'clock, and there are people who come in at night shift because we cover up the 24 hours. The person who come in early morning and then they say good morning, and the person who is leaving who finishes in a light night shift or hot night shift, they say good night. The time difference, right? The time difference is so right now I'm saying namaste, whether I meet you at the morning, whether I meet you at night, whether I meet you during the day, whether I meet you anytime, we say namaste. Same way, Zozolopa to everybody. So there's no time difference. Whereas in English language, you have to say, look at the, look at the sky and then what should I say? Do I say good morning or good afternoon? Or, you know, people get confused, but in our language, there's no confusion. You just say Zozolopa, that's all. Even for the higher people, lower people, namaskar, namaste, these kind of, you know, high ranking, high intonation, all this. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, that was a little bit confusing for the people who are learning English language. Should I say good morning? Or when I will look at the watch, oh, it is good afternoon. Oh my God, I've made a mistake. I should have said the good morning because it is before noon. That's not the Nepal Vasa. That's the kind of a different kind of language. So Nepal Vasa is a very simple language. The only simplest one, you know, I can give you some features of Nepal Vasa right now. So which language do you prefer? Should I speak in Nepali or should I speak in English language? I ask you the boat. What do you want to you know, hear from me? Do you want me to speak in Nepal Vasa or do you want me to speak in English or do you want me to speak in Nepali? I'm fluent in all three languages. So Somebody, English. Okay, so, well, one person say English and other person say Nepal Vasa. Maybe so a mix of English. <laughs> so I'll be go back and forth. I will put my legs sometimes in Nepal Vasa and sometimes in English and sometimes in Nepal so that you will see the clear difference of what is the Nepal Vasa looks like. So structural difference, the meaning difference. So most of the time when people start, hey, I'm learning Newari. The Newari is not the actual term for us to say because Newari is a given by somebody else who is not Newar. So it was started into 1937. So who study came from Europe is called John Sargent, uh, Jorgensen. So he's the one stay in Nepal for so many years and they learned Nepal Basa at the time. And then he was guided by the non newa people. That's why the name was given to in you know, a Because in Indo-Aryan st structure, Nepali, Hindi, Marathi, these are e -E -E kind of a form is it like a you know, given to you know, new people of new language also that's why it's called new but we i started campaigns around the world that new is not a favorable for me or for us for the whole people of nepal or whole people of new community that we are de denying to accept the word new either you can say new language either you can say nepal wasa either you can say you know, new bha. so bha came from basa so that's how it happened so for example, just a very simple example. You know, everybody know what is the word for uh, duck, D-U-C-K, duck in Nepali. Can anyone give me a word for duck in Nepali? What is the word for duck, D-U-C-K? Us. 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 Okay, anybody else? So we say has. So, but in Nepal, Vasa, we say hen. So is that the same word? It came from the same parent word or what? Maybe different, right? So hangsa is a Sanskrit word that become has in Nepali. And then we call it he because hangsa, so S is dropped. S is dropped and that big leftover is a has. So has became the he. He, ke, te, se. These are all came from Sanskrit, but when it turn into Nepal Vasa, it becomes kind of deleted the last consonant. Has, when the person say has, S A N S. There is no O. Oh, hasa. It's not a hasa. It's a has. So the ended in consonant. So the ended in consonant is the Nepal Vasa feature that we don't pronounce the end consonant and it becomes kind of like a contemporary Nepal Vasa we call he. Nepal, N E P A L. Nobody say N E P A L A Nepala. Nobody say that. But so Nepal is the ended in consonant. So we drop that ended consonant. Then we say Nepal. The reason why we call Nepal because it has a compensatory lengthening kind of a theoretical point we already applied in Nepal Vasa. So that means the Nepal Vasa is a monosyllabic language. One sound, one word, and one meaning. Ka, da, la, na. These are all single, single word, single meaning, and single sound. So that's what the you know Nepal Vasa looks like. May I have a permission to share a screen? Yes, done. You can share it. Okay, so let's see now. Sometimes I get kind of a conf you know, not confused, but nervous when I started sharing something. Uh, can you see? No, I didn't uh, introduce too much myself because Sadisha already gave me who I am and where I'm from and what I did, all these things. So definitely, yeah. So before I go into this subject matter, I saw only four people participating in this group. May I ask you for 15 seconds? 
I know the name, tell your name, where you were born, and then uh, what is your mother tongue or uh, first language, and why you are learning. So four, four points in 15 seconds. Who wants to go first? Okay, My, I, can, I can begin. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Jiguna Supriya Manamar, um Ali uh Tana Yele. Um this is where I was born as well. Um and uh, the reason why I'm wanting to learn is because Nevada Basa is my mother language and it's not something I've ever been very strong in. So um, I enrolled in a class to get a grasp of grammar and be able to build my own sentences. Um, and as I said, my mother language is Nevalbasa. However, that was not the first language I learned in my la life. My, the first language I learned in my life was Khas Nepali. Thank you, Sube. Next, please. I'm not going to call anybody's name. Please come forward. We have a very short time, so. Just volunteer yourself, so I'm not going to call uh, anybody. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I live in Ananagar, so I'm not that good. So actually, uh, uh, Nepal Basa has might have been my ancestor's mother language, but I started learning in uh, Nepali, and I wanted to learn about uh, the language itself. Thank you. Next. So, Miru Namje Nandita, Mujhe Darjeeling ko, Darjeeling Okay. Darjeeling Bata. Uh, born and brought up in Darjeeling, I'm presently working in Siliguri. So, uh, none of my family members also know Nepal Bhasa. So, I wanted to learn. That's why I'm taking the step. Thank you. Thank Next. You. Thank you. Who is left? I saw six people in the group. Anurup Kumar. Namaste, Jojo Lapa. My name is Kumar Shrestha. My name is Kathmandu. My mother tongue is Nepali language. In Nepal, I have to learn communication with my family. Thank you. Too bad. OK, great. Hi, my name is Anurup. Uh, I was born in Delhi. Um, my mother tongue is Sindhi. And uh, I want to learn Nepal Bhasa because uh, I developed a sense of uh, connection with the language. I live in Patan, so I wanted to understand more about the culture. Language was one way to learn it. So I'm learning. OK, so it looks like a. Thank you very much. So giving you a short introduction, now I know who you are. So now I can build up my lecture of where I should lead to about it. So uh, if you are seeing my screen that I put together the linguistics and technical aspects. So uh, this, I just presented this one in another gathering a few months ago. Uh, so basically, you know, these days, um, you know, all the South Asian languages based on Sanskrit. And then all the South Asian languages based on Sanskrit and also the script, like O I E E A I O O. These are the things we learn from, you know, from because when you learn Sanskrit at a time, long time ago, so you are a learned person, you are a pundit. So to become a pundit, you need to learn Sanskrit. To become a pundit, you don't learn English at the time. So same way, almost of the South Asian languages or the Hindi as well as all the Indian languages and also the languages now. So they are also, you know. So people go to Banarashi, Varanashi for being a pundit, and then they learn and come back and get the Bisharada, blah, 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 Acharya, all these things were kind of a gain their, you know, like a title. So just like these days, the masters and bachelors and PhD and blah, 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 all this. So now shifting from Sanskrit to English language, it turned into now these days, the learning um, atmosphere became like a, okay, English oriented or maybe French oriented or Japanese oriented, all these things. So that's why when we went to school and we learn uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. So we, did, we learn all these things. So based on all these sounds, what we have structurally from the, uh, from the vocal cord. So when we open our mouth, 
and without touching the sound anywhere in the mouth. So it all comes out and that becomes a sound. And it, that's how, you know, all has nothing to you know, do with that. It's a clear voice coming out from your lung. And then, then no way is touching. The sound no way is touching. And just open your mouth to split the, the lips and then round the lips. And that becomes the power. So in Nepal, Vasa, there are only uh, you know, it looks like we are going to elementary school right now for a few seconds. So just to give you some hints that in how uh, Nepal was a structure, it can be analyzed based on the linguistic structure of, you know, contemporary linguistics. So I have put together, you don't need to write down anything, just wanting to, you know, show you that this is the structure of Nepal. So in Nepal, Vasa, we have a six vowels only. So my, I'm saying six vowels only. You don't need to say I and O and on and all. These are all kind of like extra. We were taught by our pundit and guru and everybody from the past. So right now, I'm saying that we have only six vowels, so just like A and A and E and A and O and U, and those can be a little bit nasalized, like A and A and E and things. so these are things, in, and also it can be long. So when I say long, that means uh, every single one line regular and to long one. So when it changes, the meaning changes. And then its meaning changes is very, very crucial in Nepal. So that's why the people from other languages, they have a very difficult of making the sound short too long. So that's why it has difficult to understand, difficult to uh, listen and difficult to pronounce. For example, oh has no meaning, but if you say oh, it has a meaning. Oh means mango, ah uh, uh, means another one. So a similar way, ko means one, one, one sound, it has a one meaning. If it's called ko, it has a different meaning. Ko means a torn or kara in Nepal, in Nepali. So ko is a one word, and it has a ko is a I saw. So it's another one. So these are the, that's why it's called the monosyllabic language. One sound, one letter, one you know, meaning. So these features are very, very important to understand when you are learning the Nepal Bhasa in school. So same way, it can be also long and also nasalized. So nasalization is anusur in Nepali, and as a long one is a breath. We call the bisarga. So we put the bisarga in lots of places. These days we put bisarga. Even we call Nepal, we put the bisarga. Bisarga mm -hmm. is very very important in Nepal also learning. If you not put the bisarga, it has no meaning. For example, kewa. Kewa is another word in Tibetan uh, Tamang language. They say kewa means a puja. So Newa and newa. Newa is no meaning at all, but it has to be newa. So it's a long one. So that's what the picture is different. So every single one has a different. So similarly, I'm going to a little bit the consonant part, just giving you some information then how the language you know uh, is recognized as a Nepal Vasa or new. So I also put together K have a KS category and G has a GS category and then ngo, ka ka ga ga ngo, right? Now I'm go back coming back to that you know in a parenthesis one G uh, N G H so it has a different category so C C H Cha Cha Ja Ja and then Y Ta Ta Da Da and Na so these are all kind of like going to uh, going to different categories. So the reason why I am putting all this together for you to be able to understand first of all you need to know what kind of sounds are available in Nepal Vasa. So definitely uh, once you know all these things. So definitely, you know, a lot of people say that, oh, when you speak Nepali, I mean, like a Nepal Vasa, so people speak like totara mota, totara mota, right? So everybody say that, you go, why? There's a linguistic value of why it is being, because in Nepali, uh, there are two different kinds of tea. So tea with the dental and tea with the retroflex. So retroflex and dental is not, are not available in Nepal Vasa. What we have is a alveolar. Alveolar means a very similar to the English uh, T and D. So that's what it's called. When the people speak uh, uh, Nepal Vasa, people speaking Nepali, and then they switch from one to another, and they don't know exactly which one needs to be produced. Uh, the person like I am, so I can intentionally know how to make it, you know, correct sound for the people who are native speaker Nepali language and Nepali language, and they do not know which one is correct and which one is not correct, but they produce the same sound, which is whether it is a you know ta or which is the ta, so both are kind of you know, confused for them. So they produce only one sound. That one sound is alveolar, alveolar sound. So that alveolar sound is very close to either one for the listeners. Same way in you know, a labial is pa pa ba ba, and then the ma. And the reason, okay, now I'm going back to the. So we also have a you know a nasalized 
is the aspirated form. The aspirated means support systems like to make it the core, you have to put the K with the H. To make it the core, you have to put the H with the G, right? G. So that's why the G is pronounced. So if the Sanskrit pundits have developed a different kind of a symbol for the ka and then the ga, then we don't have to, you know, make a difference for this kind of a K, K, S, G, G, S. So same way we learn from the Indo-Aryan languages and Nepal was also based on the Indo-Aryan language from the literal point of view, but from a spoken point of view, Nepal also, also has a N, S, Ngo, also has a N, S, N, Ngo, and Ngo. The Ngo sound is already you know, disappeared or lost. Same way, you know, Da, 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 yon, and yon, we have a yon that also disappear in contemporary language. Same way, you know, da, 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 no. So no also had the no, n h. So in Devnagri, you have to put the n half and then ha. So that's the no. Because na is a no, so no is pronounced as a na. Because I don't know how to say, it's very difficult for some people who are not familiar with the no, making sound is no. And it becomes na. So na is means a butcher and na is the nose. And that's the difference because it has to be a very minimal difference to make it a more, uh, you know, comparatively the two. So na, if you're trying to say your nose, if you say na, 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 you are not saying the nose, you are saying a butcher. So mm -hmm. I mean, you are saying you myself is a butcher. Na is an, uh, like a kosan or something in Nepali. So na and na is a totally different kind of a word. It's a small difference. So same way, pop up above ma and ma also has a ma. So ma, is, if you call it like a ma, this means a glue, like a, uh, I don't know what's called in Nepali, glue. So, but ma is the body. Or if you use the word ma, the long one, that means a lid, the metal lid. So that's why the sound changes based on the feature of the Nepal Vasa sound production. Same way in R, so R has also the L together with the, R and L both are kind of a one kind of a sonoran sound. So that sonor sound also has R, R with a ra and la with L with the la. So la is a water and la. I mean, la is like a saliva coming out from your mouth and la is the hand. So small difference is added with it. So these kind of very basic sounds, if you are familiar with all the features, probably you will be able to you know, produce your uh, you know, structure of your language and structure of learning the language. Same way we have, we do not have a more than, you know, three kinds of saw in Sanskrit. We have a saw, 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 three kinds of S is given in Sanskrit based on the Nepal uh, Devanagari script. But whereas in Nepal Vasa, we have only one S that is called S, saw. Sa, sa, masa, all these things, uh, only one kind of saw, but H, H is very, very, you know, strong. So in between the two vowels, if S appears, then it will disappear. Tapa, right? So we have to make it tapa, the long one. So S comes out at the middle of the two different vowels. It becomes like a, not a ha, but the, the a. So these are the, you know, structural difference in sound. Same way in Y. So I put the Y, W, also Y also has a yao and yao. So yao is white, light, very, very light. Yao is the, the, the color red. So yao and yao. And the W also called wa. That wa also has a wa and wa. So wa is like a you know the pancake, uh, like a bara. And then wa is a hole. So these are the you know basic sounds you will see that you know. So like um, I have put the one um, you know example boy boy. So it could be written either way b o y b o i or b w o i. So both are acceptable by sound, but in a writing system. B double O I is accepted. Boy, boy. Choi and Choi. C H O I or C H W O I. Both are acceptable by pronouncing from your from your mouth, but the writing is has to be a certain way. So these are the strict rule of writing in you know, a Now same way, uh, these are all I have given. So probably I'm not gonna go through all these. So every single particle has a so for example, the long and short vowels are kind of a given. So ka is one particle. If you use the ka into ku, and then ku means to you know to, to wear the umbrella, chata warno. So that means chata ku. Ku is number six. So ka, ku, 
who six number six then con is tell me you tell me something so con 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 so and who who is the farmers you know like kodalo kodalo in nepali so kun is a tip so every single sound con who kun single single sound monosyllabic con con long one and then kun is smoke and then kun ku is a scar like something you have a mark in your skin so that's that's the difference where ga also have every single sound ka ka ga ga nga every single sound has a short one long one and nasalized and also the so there are 24 different kinds of vowels are used in nepal bhasa can you believe that we learn only a a e a a o o 12 different vowels in devanagari but whereas in nepal bhasa if you look at into feature of nepal bhasa in a spoken form we have we are using 24 different kinds of vowels in nepal bhasa so this is how. Now I will give you some examples from English uh, comparative also. Same way I also have the e to saw it, and u when you say just the e, e oh showing something to the okay here here here. So that's kind of word. The so same way in a to uh, to u uh, u means to uh, the, the 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 barking the dog is barking. So go ahead. It's a u u is a word for the barking right. And then wa, wa is he or she. So example in Nepal wasa, there's no difference between you know male or female wa or wa. So it's the same thing for just like in not in the, as in English he and she is different. She is for feminine and for he is for feminine. But in Nepal wasa we have only one wa. Same way in Nepali also we have a u and uni. So uni could be a feminine and u could be a male. So, but in Nepal wasa we have only one. So just recently you know about a few years ago I wrote a book. The name of my book is called the Why of What I Do. And in order to translate that Why of What I Do into he is pregnant. So it is not mm -hmm. very appropriate to say he is pregnant in a natural way, but the name of the book is he is pregnant. So I show you some books when I do with the other you know, screen sharing. So that means it has to be uh, defined, or given some different. It has to define like that. So these are kind of features that in you know, contemporary feature I put together as you know different way of you know, looking to the Nepali and you know English language. So Nepal Vasa is very, very simple. I'm saying Nepal Vasa is very, very simple. It's not that difficult to learn, but you need to understand the structural values of Nepal Vasa, then you will be able to catch up so easily and then you will never forget about it once you start you know, paying attention on what we are talking about over here. So. Okay, I-N, so we start the I-N is like E, E is a sickle, it's a hashia. And then Un is a first face, Un is a face, like Wan is a he or she. So E, if it is a long one, and then speech. So the tuk coming out from your mouth is a tuk. So tuk is the E, oh, you got lots of E in your mouth. So same way, U, okay, we already talked about, and then Wa is a lentil, lentil cake. So definitely these are the, some of the examples I have given. Oh, koshi, koshi, koshi is a plot like a mato uh, So koshi. And then koshi. So koshi and koshi is a very clear difference between the two words. One is koshi, other one is koshi. So if you forget to say koshi, that means you are talking about the clay pot. That's what the structural difference. That's what the sound difference. That's what you know you need to understand to mix your delim. So, yeah. so if you say T Y A A, tia, if you start saying tia, 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 that means you are chopping something in a chopping board. Tia, 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 tia. So, same way, tia, if you say tia, that means tia means a cylinder or something, it has a solid cylinder. So, like a cup or anything, it's called a tia, right? So, similarly, we have so many different features you can find in Nepal Vasa. Uh, kaila, kaila, can I take it? Uh, wokaila. Okay, so now the sound kaila and wokaila means the that second one is for sun and the first one is for to take it. So difference is ka and then kaila, right? So the same sound, but it has a different meaning in a structural, you know, when you use in a structure, so definitely it does. So same way, I'm also giving you some case marks. I don't know whether how much familiar you are with this. Uh, in, in Nepali, we call the bibhakti. So bibhakti, saptam bibhakti, pratham bibhakti, uh, all kinds of bibhakti are used in Nepali. So same way in Nepal Vasa also we have a bibhakti. So as I given example earlier, so Nepal is a name of the country and then we don't call that Nepal. Gano wanigu if you call that Nepal. So now L appears in that then from the ability, ability in them from like butter, Nepal long. 
Ja, Jale, Jalon, Chon, Chene, Chonon. So these are the, uh, the uh, guess marks we use uh, to uh, use who is doing what to whom. So when you ask the question, who is doing what to whom, you get the answer by using all the case marks. So the case mark is a structural value and also it has a suffixes. Suffixes added like a structure, the, the structure of the word. But the case mark is the meaning. It indicates the meaning. Without case marks, no one can speak any language. It has no meaning. If there is no case mark, what's going to happen? Samala patala pakamarala. What is the meaning of that? Anybody can you know give me an example, a give meaning of that. Samala patala pakamarala. So there is no case mark. What is the meaning of that? Samala patala pakamarala. Anybody can guess what is the meaning of that? I'm asking you. So samala patala pakamarala. Na patala pakamarala. Okay, so this is a kind of like a you know interaction with me. So what is the meaning? I, I remember there was some story. I don't know whether it was a real story or just a funny story of like uh, someone who was very barely educated and he couldn't write the kokakiki, uh, all of that. So he just wrote the single, uh, so the single consonants when writing a letter home. So this was like a code, <laughs> code for like jamal pathau bokai mori so something like that. And so instead of writing it out articulated as such, the writing came out samala. And, and all of that. That's what, I, that's what I remember. Yes. Samala patala, samala patau, na patala paka marala, na patau paka marsu. So now this has a meaning, but there is no case mark. But at least it is kind of a law. So who is, who, uh, who is doing what to whom? So that question you will get from the, uh, from the structure of you know, case marks. So these are very, every single language is bound with the case mark to get the answer from who is doing what to whom. So that's why we need to have an understanding of case mark. So now nominative form, so I have given some, let me go a little more detail on that. So nominative form means like a name name by itself. So G as myself, and then I did it. So I G, and then to me is a Jita. So, and then jita also sometimes called as a da because the t, t has a tendency of becoming the, you know, the voice form like a ta becomes da. So this is very common in most of the, the, the language in Nepal Vasa. So cha becomes cha for, for, in Nepali we say timi, timi le or tapain, tapain le. Uh, tapain is honorific form. So chanta to you, to be timi lai. A wa is he or she, he or she wa by him and then wayata to her, to her or him. So ipi de and then imisa by them and also imita is to them. So these are kind of us, the, the, the case marks are used. Now I have a sentence over here. So ji thong cham cha sakka zanaya. So uh, they, I can analyze on this one. So when I say jin chan jin, so now I put the hyphen over here. So that becomes jin. So thong is one word, cham cha is another word, right? Cham cha, and then I added n here and sakka, sa, so and double k, so sakka and za and then naya. So na and then. Okay, so that's how we uh, we separated this. So G, I, N is for maile, tong is aza, and today, so samcha is a spoon, and samcha is by spoon, and then sa is um, uh, delicious, and sakka is deliciously, and then za is. Now, from the cultural point of view, when you see someone at 12 o'clock, people ask the Zanian Tunala. Is there something that you know that could be a just only eating a rice or it could be something else? So that in the morning time is part like a lunch. If you see somebody in the, at night time or evening time, six o'clock, five o'clock after that. So when you say Zanya Dunala, or have you eaten rice? So a lot of people they translate the word za is for cook rice, bath. So bath kayo. So that hat may not be the same way that maybe he's not eating a bath, but he's eating a roti. Did we never ask that the roti kayo? 
never ask that. When you see someone in the early morning, nobody asks that, Chura uh, Kayo. So nobody asks that, that comes to, but uh, it has an extended meaning, za means a dinner or also for the lunch. So that's what the, when you look at the cultural point of view for all different languages, so it has a different word. But whereas in English, dinner is for not for the morning time and then lunch is not for the evening time. But when you go to work at middle of the night and your lunch time is there, even not you are not eating a lunch at 12 o'clock, but people still say that lunch time. So it has extended meaning. Every single language has a different kind of you know, meaning for the every single context and also for the environment of the using tone. So uh, using the, here the N is a guest bark. So as I, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, this N is a case mark and in N also here is a case mark, case mark. So, and then here is a no ya. So ya is like uh, ending of the, you know, ya is for the person speaking gene. So, and then double K is like an adjective, uh, adjective into a, a modification of adjective. So sa sakka. So za is a noun. Now I'm going to put all together. So jin is a pronoun. Pronoun, and then the n is a case mark. Uh, case mark, and chamcha is a noun, and then again case mark. Case mark, and sa is a base of ad, uh, base of adjective. A D J adjective, and then modifier M O D modifier modifier, and za is a noun, and by itself. Uh, so and then now is a verb or root, verb root, and then why is a. I have to give a different lecture on why why is there because all the bars are there are six different kinds of categories. So this is the uh, let's just say the root extended root uh, x uh, r and then the, the past uh, conjunct. So that's the analysis now. So in order to get that sentence into Nepali, so I put together maile aza samchale mito. Uh, me talk, I don't know how to say, me talk, okay, but so here I can analyze more and then separate with the ile, aza, chamcha, and then uh, samcha, okay, so and then another le. And then mito and bad and ka and then ye ka and then yes. So that's how the separation comes in. So all this is you know structural changes. So every single language has this, this kind of a structural value. So if you know the structural value of the language, then you will be able to you know, understand and also you can build up your own sentence, not memorizing. So sometimes the people have a habit of memorizing the sentence. Blah, 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 all the sentences you memorize. But if the people are speaking, the native speaker never, 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 never say the same way what we learn in a paper. What did you hear that? The first time you are hearing, I even never, never understand what the people are saying. So when the native speaker say, they always say fast, same, thing. same way in English language also. When I was speaking to a person who came from Texas, you know, United States, they speak in a different accent. So that's what's called the accent, you know. So same way, you know, every single language has a the slang form and non-slang form and colloquial form and written form and standard form and all different kinds of form. So right now I'm focusing only on the spoken form. That spoken form could be a little bit different than the written form. So the written form is very important in learning the grammar. And then in a spoken form, the how do people contracted all the sounds with the you know, sentence. So that's what, if you understand all these things, so definitely it will be very easy for you to. Uh, okay, so now uh, let's see, I have already 
spend half an hour. Uh, I was given only one hour time, definitely. So do you have any questions so far right now? So it's like, a, it's not just the lecture, it's also the, you know, interaction. So my group is always with the interactive class. I do not know whether you are taking a nap, listening, my listening, or just interacting with me. So I would like to see the feedback from what did you learn right now? So maybe end of the, this uh, lecture, I would like to ask you some, what is your, you know, take away from my, you know, listening to me. So definitely, you know, there'll be something. So go ahead and come up with any question if you have, then I will go further. Did I go fast or what? So it looks like, you know, are you using the 40 miles or 60 miles of driving? So I don't know how many miles. So Supriya know that how many miles I was driving at this moment. Well, I would say quite fast, but um, I would also assume perhaps we can receive something like a reference document um, of what you've uh, just shown us. Um, um, so I'm actually not in this current batch of uh, Disney Valvasa class. It's a toy and yone batch. Uh, so I graduated from that and I'm just popping by for today's lecture. Um, and we, of course, like with Business Shah, we explored a lot of different ways of understanding you know, structure and all these things. Um, but I haven't quite had a chance to see like this. You've basically used um, um, the Latin alphabet to uh, sort of phonetically categorize and break down words and structures. And, and this was new to me. Uh, this is a different way of analysis. So um, I'm happy to come reason, across that. The reason why I use that you know, Romanized uh, script is is very e uh, easy to analyze because if you use the word ka ka ga ga and you have to make it half of the ka by using the Holland. And then the people who are learning the Palbasa language, so they get kind of confused how to make it, you know, cha. Now, how do you write cha? You have to use this cha, cha, and then cut into Holland and then ya, and then uh, wa and then also uh, you know onusor. So in Romanized script, you can each one every sound which is combined with the one word can be seen very clearly from the visualization and also from hearing. So that's why I use uh, Romanized forms. So please be don't be shy. You must speak. If you have any question in your you know, mind, just speak up and I'll be happy to answer if you, can, uh, if you need some help. Looks like everybody kind of a quiet. No question, no nothing. Not at this particular point, but there may be later on. Okay, so the so as I mentioned that there are so many different kinds of vowels, so many you know, uh, la la ma ma na na ya ya wa wa. So those are kind of a new sound for probably the learners. So most of the uh, on the rope. Kumar, Jiwan, Nandita, and Supriya. So, because all of you uh, did not grow up speaking the Parvasa as a first language. So that's why these sounds probably a little bit difficult to, you know, produce. But uh, using the English language, using the Nepali language, these are kind of like a foreign to you, foreign, foreign sound. Ma. So ma, ma, so ma by itself is like a body. If you start saying longer one, that ma becomes the lead, the, the metal lead, lead. So that's what it's a na, it's a na. Ma, ma, la, la, swa, wa, swa, swa. So these are kind of a very uh, unique sound in Nepal Vasa. Probably uh, uh, when you learn something in Nepal Vasa, so if you pay attention, I'm repeatedly saying again, they pay attention the sounds and also the, uh, how it, they are going to be produced. So definitely then you will be able to pronounce. If you not understand the other people who are speaking, so you may wanna pay attention then over and over, over and over, what is going on here? What is going on here? So that you will be able to understand that. Thing. So uh, since you have no questions, so definitely, uh, okay. So the other feature in Nepal Vasa, what we have over here is like a, Counting the numbers is very unique in Nepal Vasa. You just count like a one, two, three, four, or like a, uh, you know, Yota, Jita, Chinta, Chata. In Nepali, you used to use 
एक दी तीन चार इन नेपाली इज लाइक न्यूमेरल नंबर इफ यू काउंट द थिंग्स यू हैव टू से इधर काउंट एक जाना दुई जाना तीन जाना और ये उठा दुई ता तीन ता बट इन नेपाल भाषा द यूनिक फीचर ऑफ नेपाल भाषा इज अ वी डिफरेंशिएट बिटवीन द ह्यूमन एंड एनिमेट एंड इन एनिमेट एनिमेट एंड इन एनिमेट मींस अ जीवित र निर्जीव सो जीव इज ऑलवेज यूज अ म छम निम सम पेम न्याम खुम हेम च्याम गुम चिम so one two three four one two the living beings insect reptiles animals people president sachiv anyone is a chama 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 mani 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 ma ma is used for the personification anything which is not a living or a non living thing so like a table chairs uh, marbles uh, stones uh, uh pens the pencil um, the computer the paper and anything these are all non living things so every single non living of non living thing are counted as a uh, different way so for example it is a flat it's a pa sapa ni pa sapa if it is a round it's a ga thaga ni ga sanga pe ga if it is a uh, thin long one it's a chapu ni pu sapu pe pu so they are it differentiate from the uh, from um, you know the size of the object and also the uh, let's see whether it is a flat whether it is a round whether it is a thin long whether it is a thin whether it is a some so the same way there are some structural like structurally specific kind of uh, you know uh, classifier all in the palwasa we call taji go and i started saying bothala go but not the taji go so these are very unique in nepal bhasha so without having these you know classifiers in nepal bhasha you are not able to use the actual um, you know, actual counting of the you know objects so thawo nyu wo songo pingo in a normal way but when the native speaker start saying so i'm going to write down uh thabu so and then uh thaba so thama uh monu so now I would like to pay attention, uh, draw your attention. The here's an edge there. So this edge appears in between. Um, chama, chama, manu. So this ma becomes ma. When the native speaker say that, they never say chama, manu, but they say chama, manu. So that ma. has a ma sound underlying but edge is kind of a deleted not deleted actually go silent so chama ni ma sumo pe ma ni ma kuma same way in chagu uh, chagu mech so now i say mech chagu mech so this gu also kind of like a g gets kind of silence not saying that chagu but chau 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 ni sumo pe ma ni so this a sound from h and sound from ga becomes a little bit silent but not deleted you can hear that very very little but you cannot just uh, hear very freely so that's what the thau nyu song pyo nyao ko neu chao gu chu so you don't see the thau gu ni gu song gu pyo ngo is the underlying form is gu but the non underlying form or the superficial form it becomes u so this is also another characteristics of nepal bhasha so when the native speaker speak so they have a habit of using as fast as possible so you so you know when you know so what is the what am i saying because the gu is there but we don't hear that gu ma is there we don't hear. so same way all another feature of nepal was the all the adjectives so for example in nepali rato pailo hariyo sheto kalo purke tilo so all the adjectives needs to be added with this kind of a gu and ma ma su gu gulab swan masu masu is a color it never appears the same way as it is in nepali or in english yellow flower so you don't say that you need to add something with the yellow masu and gu masu gu pa to you go tofuli so that's what these are kind of masu ma manu to you ma manu so masu ma manu means a yellow man or to you ma manu is a white man so this ma appears with the adjective also these kind of features are very unique in for nepal bhasha and definitely uh, probably once you are learning this thing so these features are important to keep in mind to analyze and definitely you will have some extended uh, extended meaning of you know, analyzing the uh, text so the another hard part of an analyzing the nepal bhasha is the verb structure the verb structure is a little bit 
if you look at into one you know simple way it's very easy but if you look at that simple way into a difficult part then you will never be learning that one. so the reason why i'm saying is um, uh, noye uh, dhaye uh, kaye these are all ended with the a so noye dhaye kaye and then ba so this is the verb. So naya means to eat, dai means to say, and kai means to take, and be -E means to give. So uh, now in the first person, what happens actually? Ji uh, naya. So ji naya. But in the past tense, what happens? Ji naya. So now this a changes into a and then g tie same way g tie and then g tie so it has a you know added with the ya yeah. and then kai g kai g kai and g koya so this ka becomes ko because both are kaya. Kaya is like a uh, not easy to make a simul uh, simultaneous sound. Ah, uh ah, -uh is not sometimes it's not so. We try to eliminate as it so. Bia, jim bia, 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 and then becomes bia. So there's another ya yeah here. So every single one has a y, and this is the one category of verb. Jin na. No, oh, yeah. So it has a Y, 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 and here. So when this changes into, you know, you or he, and then that becomes Bila. And then Dhala. And then the third one is Kala. And then the fourth one is uh, Bila. So Bila. So Y changes to L, 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 L here. So all this. So these are a little bit difficult to you know to make sure because you are not used to understand the uh, understand the change of the sound inside the verb categories or uh, structure. So this is the hardest part. But so the first one. So Excuse the me? first one. So Nandita, yeah. Uh, the first one, Nyayiji, that noye, it's noye. Bila, noye, that it is it Bila or it, the oh, last oh, one? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, sorry, in the sense, uh, I was just... Thanks for pointing my mistake. Nala, Tala, Kala, Bila. So this L is there. So now you can. Uh, I have the book, uh, so you can get the book from the uh, So the easiest part is to Nepal Vasa, Bahursa, structurally two different forms only. Ma, Hami, Timi, U, three different uh, pronouns. But in Nepal Vasa, we have only two kinds. One is the speaker who is speaking myself, and then who is listening you and then she or he. Doesn't matter, it's the same form. Jinaya, Jimison Naya, we ate, I ate. Ton Nala, Imison Nala, or one Nala. You ate, he ate, they ate, it's the same thing. So the speaker is I myself, and the hearer is both you and he. So that means in technical way, in linguist from Nepal, all you know, linguist people in South Asia, and they started saying the Atma and Para, self and non self. So I'm speaking self and the listeners are non-self. So difference between the structure of the bars in Nepal Vasa is self with non-self. And also the by tense wise, talko hisabma, only something is happen is a past and something is not happen is non-past. So that's a very simple way. You don't need to go to uh, these are things that are unreliable for Nepal. So you just remember everything is happened and everything is not happened. 
And I like to say that all the people, the English speaking people making the future in a very Zabarzasti way. You know, there is no future tense in English. Can you believe that? Who does not believe that there is no future in English? I'm asking you a question. In English language, there is no future tense. How do you make a future tense in English language? Give me one sentence. So I will eat. Okay, who said that? Uh, I said, sir. Okay, the, I don't see your picture here. <laughs> it, Could you yeah. give me your name? Jivan, sir. Jivan. Jivan, okay. Jivan say, I will eat. Mm. So, what is the meaning of will? No, I'm asking the meaning of will. Will. Hmm. I think Supriya understood what I'm trying to say. Could you please explain for me? Uh, I mean, maybe you can. There is no future in English language. Um, I'm not sure if uh, I would be able to explain it in the same vein that you may be anticipating. But I guess what you're trying to say is, I mean, technically, we've all been taught in school about the three tenses and you know, the tenses within, and there's like within the tenses, there are different forms that like he ate in the past, he is eating, he will eat and so on, etc. But when you uh, analyze, when you do a surgery of the sentence and you look at it word by word, then there is no specific word that exactly aims at the future as such. It's just like the combination that gives us the impression of, of of giving this meaning of something happening in the future. So if we look at the word will by itself, the will is like, it's an ambiguous word. It can have like multiple meanings, like the will of man or something like that. Um, um, is, is that what you're trying to get at, I guess? Yes, yes. So that's what I said earlier, that English people are making Zabarzas the future. They are making Zabarzas the future. They are teaching us to make it Zabarzas the future. And I guess- I uh, Oh, that's you. Yeah, just sorry to uh, interject, but I guess just out of curiosity, I would like to know some examples of different languages in the world that do have a future tense in a more meaningful way, as, as you might um, infer. Yes, South uh, African languages and also some. Um, um, there are several languages spoken in uh, spoken in African countries, so they have a present tense for one form and then future tense for another form and past tense for another form, but they never add anything like will in English. It's a clear G there. So same way in Nepal Basa, we have a one is done and one is not done. So done is a naya and not done is naya. So that's the two different forms. Of so that's why linguistically the Nepal Basa is analyzed. There are only two tenses in Nepal Basa. But we can make it, you know, the like continuous tense, like a chona, staying, staying, eating. Naya chona, naya chona, never end yet. Ji naya tuna, tuna is ended. So not uh, naya, naya chona is in like a, still eating, like a continuous tense. So these are aspect of the tenses, not like a you know, structural difference. So in British English, they use the word shall. I don't know where the shall come from. So because you are using shall to make it future, we are using a will in American English to make it future. So that will means itcha. So I wish to you know, be there, I will go there means I wish to go there. So that's why they're making a little bit of a system, but there's no structural difference. Like I, I teach and then the tense, past tense is a thought. There's no future tense. Clear structural future tense is not available in it. So other way around, if you say that in English language, every single verb in English is so different. That's why the people who are old age enough, they when they go to learn English, because I teach English language to the, uh, the ages, aged people, senior people also, they have a hard time to make it different because do always become did. And eat becomes ate, see becomes saw, go becomes went. So, uh, so different, every single verb in English is a different structure, but not like a G, Naya, Naya, Nala. So the base of the verb is the same in most of them. Even in Nepali also, Danu, Ja, Kanu, Ka, Launu, La, Panu, Ban, these are very, you know, basics are very, very, you know, similar in most of the cases in the Nepali and other languages. But whereas in English, it is different. So every single verb needs to be so. 
Uh, when I say that all these things, so in Nepal Vasa, we have a speaker versus um, uh, hearer, and also the 10 difference is a uh, pass versus non pass. So those are the linguistically analyzed in, uh, in Nepal Vasa. On, you know, most of the, you know, the uh, linguistic people, they already accepted that it's a non pass and then passed, and also the speaker versus hearer are very. And the other one is also in Nepal Vasa, we can also see the intentional versus unintentional. If anything is happening intentional, that means it shows in a sentence. If it is unintentional, it shows in a sentence. So that is also another feature of Nepal Vasa. For example, jeans are nine. You are intentionally going to eat the rice or the bath. Jeans are nalala. If you start saying that jeans are nalala, I don't remember whether I eat or not eat. Not intentionally. is clearly intentional and then So it's unintentional. So those kind of intentional action versus non-intentional action is also available in the structural value of the Nepal Vasa. So that's the another feature. There are so many special features we can find in Nepal Vasa. Definitely, you know, it won't be, I won't be able to give you all the examples uh, within this one hour time I was given. So definitely these are the things, you know, um, what what I can cover up for at this moment. So definitely there are so many things to, to talk about it. Uh, but that's all for Bishnuji. Guli time Dani Ahana. Yeah, we're almost done. Uh, so if you yeah. guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so I have a few questions, sir. Like uh, you said that, um, so in, 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 in uh, Nepali language, so it, that khanechu is a future tense, right, sir? Definite future, yes. Definite future. Okay, uh, that, uh, that one, right. Uh, the next question that I wanted to ask is, um, as you mentioned, the counting, right? Uh, the counting, so why in Nepal Vasa it's, it's it's very difficult to count um, these inanimate objects? I mean uh, non-living objects like uh, uh, if, if you count in uh, Nepali, so you Nepal Nepal counting chapter like all get full chapter chapter into why why to distinction the living more no, non living that say, Pab, Gu, Kiki, one as a why is that? Okay, uh, let me stop sharing, then I will talk to you. Okay, so the good question. So, who asked this question? Jiwan? Yes, sir. So, please keep your all the you know, the unmute so that I will have interaction directly. You don't need to, you know, keep on the unmute, unmute, unmute. About for the question of why, I don't have any answer. For the question of why, I would also like to ask why in Nepali there are so many tenses like uni gain, ma gain, hami gayu, timi gayu, timi haru gayu, uni haru jansan. Why so different? Because it is very difficult for me to learn those things. Why? Kino chesto gariko. Ali sojilo bolao na Nepal ma Nepal basa ma jastai. Do you have any question? Do you have any answer for that? Nepali Shiknukalai say, I have a hard time to, because I grew up in Kalimpong. I'm giving you Nandita, so I grew up in Darjeeling. I went to school in Kumunini Homes in Kalimpong for 14 years. Starting from the eighth grade, I finished my college degree in Kalimpong. Yes, mm -hmm. so I'm very happy that Nandita from Darjeeling is here. Please give my regards to all the friends in Darjeeling. So I'm also a writer in Nepal. Nepal mm -hmm. uh, so so I'm a writer, uh, also not only as a linguist. Okay, so Jiwan, do you have any answer for that? Kina Nepali ma tetti thupro chayin yo keno na hami ma khan chou, hami khan chou, timi khan chou, timi hero khan chou, u khan chou, uni khan chin, tapai khan hun cha, uha khan hun cha, hazur khan hu bhaj bakshin cha, kuni ke bla bla bla. Why are so many differences in Nepali structure for the same, you know, like a, you know, verb uh, difference same way that's the way it is now i'm wearing this hat to show you that i have a nepaliness or nepalese you know identity so none of you have a nepalese identity right now i'm seeing that whether you are from germany or from you know england or from you know the poland or uh, 
uh, moon or sun or anything, but I keep my identity with me, adding my hat on my top. And behind the scene is the mountains called the Mount Hood, which is very famous in Oregon. So we are making a brotherhood relationship with the Mount Hood of Oregon and also the Mount Everest in Nepal. So we have a sister city relationship with the Mount you know, Oregon and also in Nepal. So that's the question. There's no, you know, why is not the question, but how it is in used by the native speaker is the good way to you know, take it. I have a question as well as a quick follow-up comment. Um, I do take offense to this idea of anyone's ethnic identity being reduced to like one garment or one item of clothing or something. I don't have to wear takatopi or anything to prove that I'm Newa or Nepali or whatever. It's an identity that I carry and I assert through my actions, through my speech, through my stance, through my worldview. And uh, I would do not, I would not <laughs> wish for um, this sort of reductive notion of identity to be perpetuated. This is just my request. My question, on the other hand, um, because the title of today's talk was like contemporary features of Nepal Bhasa um, and so on. Um, so as an analogy, for example, I've seen some YouTube videos where people were like, uh, I think, uh, like linguists who study English. Old English, Shakespearean English. And so they were like reading from some kind of ancient manuscript. And the way they pronounced English was so different. Uh, their use of words was very different and so on. So just out of curiosity, like, like, like I'm pretty sure Nepal Vasa also must have gone through its own stages of changes. But I'm very curious um, about like, has there been any kind of research about that? Like, did people in the past, like, for example, uh, the, you talked about like the written form and the spoken form and then like in, in the written form there are certain like sounds that are there inherent in the written form but then the native speaker when they speak very fast instead of uh, uh, toe, they, they say toe instead of togu right um, so is this like something that happened segued later on uh, uh, or like what sort of changes, what sort of dramatic changes would there have been in the past, for example, like, uh, like how, uh, like, for example, Nepal Bhasa spoken 500 years ago, if the native speakers of today were to hear some magical audio recording of Nepal Bhasa spoken 500 years ago, would they be able to understand? And what, what is like, what kind of research has been done into tra keeping track of like this evolutionary change of Nepal Bhasa, if any? Very good. So um, Kashinar Tamod has compiled uh, some of the vocabularies. Uh, I think Putra uh, Potra Di Bodhini. So that was the book when I was in Nepal already 40 years ago. So it was already published 30 years ago at the time. So 70 years ago, maybe. So in that dictionary, he has compiled the 500 vocabulary of Nepal was a vocabulary. And then there are so many inscriptions. There are so many you know, textbooks and uh, texts are already analyzed. Some people have already, but uh, that's why we have a, a uh, what is the classical, uh, classical Newari dictionary. So from the project. So many people have already, step, uh, already step, uh, studied the classical text. So from that classical text, when start, people started you know, reading the classical text and they probably these days the youngster people probably don't understand. But the people who have some sense of understanding of grammar, so they do understand that in classical text because uh, now we are kind of saying that you know, everything needs to be short and short, right? The quick, 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 everything is a computer world. Everything is a uh, digital world. So all has to be make it as small as possible and as quick as possible. So even you know, I started saying that you know these days uh, I'll um, say uh, uh, footy bear. So footy bear is a name given to one of the language that you can use in a um, use in an iPhone, use in iPhone and also in computer and all these things. So that footy bear is a certain form of the so. So thugu can be not a C H H A G U, but they started using the X X as a cha and then the gu cha and then gu that is pronounced as a thugu. So same way. 500 years ago, the language were perfectly spoken at the time. So now there's no more text is kind of compiled together. So I have a text to uh, recorded from 40 different you know, districts in Nepal. So I have a recording all those. So now it will be a valuable monument. It will be a valuable uh, document for later on if that text is analyzed after 100 years. 
So same way, a lot of people have studied the classical Nepal Vasa, but not from the, the structural analysis, but many people have done the, uh, the morphological analysis, like a word, the sounds and words and, uh, uh, you know, the case marks and all these things were already analyzed. So it is possible to, so if we don't have anyone who is, you know, the older than 100 years old, except the Satimon, uh, Satimon Jew, so he probably, you know, contemporarily used the language from the birth language and also for right now it's being slowly changed. So we can see that, you know, that can be, you know, the structure, there are some, when you look at the history of Nepal Vasa, history of Nepal Vasa, you, there's just some period. So classical period, the ancient period, and the medieval period, all this. Thing. So every single period, the structure of the language is different. So I have analyzed one of the oldest texts from 1700 something at a time. So when I analyze, the, the, the structure of the case mark structure at the time, the case mark structure at this moment is totally different. Nepal Lassan one ago. So Nepal Lassan, now Nepal Lay. So where this come from, Son and also Lay. So these kind of structural you know, changes is always in every single language you can see that in it. So if you have a text of the running text, uh, you can analyze most of the running text based on class uh, like, uh, 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 something, uh, something with uh, religious, you know, religious texts, and also Jyoti Sastra and some other kind of, you know, text. But there's no katha, there's no some Swastani Prata katha. Maybe you can analyze the Swastani Prata katha in some other ways. So there's a way of doing that. So I think I have seen that kind of uh, structural. So Danaklal Baide have done the, uh, the PhD on, you know, classical Nepal Vasa you know, analysis. So somebody's calling me. Anyway, any question? So bad, I just... Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh, any other question? So no, I did not introduce myself, who I am. Uh, Sadiqsha just said, oh, I'm the linguist or I'm the, you know. So I have a lots of, you know, if I start uh, reading my uh, CB, curricular writer, there will be a four pages. So I'm not going to take too much long time. To... <laughs> so, um, I came to United States in 1988, uh, so you can imagine that, 1988 as a, as a research assistant for one of the professor. So I joined University of Oregon to study linguistics and did my all works. Uh, by the time, you know, I have already written my thesis uh, in Kalimpong, about the Kalimpong. Kalimpong, uh, let, me sh let me share now another uh, screen so that you will see there the, all my work. Now, where do I go? I think I need to go here. Uh, I want to open my file. How do I open? The desktop. How do I go to desktop? Um, that is the desktop, okay. right? Okay, okay. So there's a one. So this book was uh, printed out. Uh, next, okay. This is the book uh, I wrote on Kalimpong. It might be useful for Nandi, uh, Nandita. Sandarbha Saite Kalimpong, that's me. It was published in 1983. So, and then going to another, it won't allow me to go it's easily. Sir? Yeah. Dobili Kalimpong, what's your signal in Nepal? Because I grew up speaking at home. Mm. Okay, this is my book. So Newab Ha Learner. It was published from Sikkim. And that's I am. 
So these are the books. So earlier I was saying that, you know, Way of Patetu, that means he is pregnant. The name of this book is he is pregnant. So I don't know whether it can be possible or not. So spoken form and written form is so Mahapragya. So he was also, uh, you know, spent many, many years in Kalimpong when he back to Nepal. So he wrote his own biography and then I started compiling and publish it. So I was interviewed in Nepal, uh, Rajin Nepal. So Shakya working for promotion of Nepalese language. It came out in 2005, almost like a, how many years ago? Um, looks like at 18, 18 years ago. So same way, this is the structure of Nepal Vasa. I mean, Nepal uh, study of Newar, uh, Newar. So I kind of, you know, draw this picture in 2004. Uh, Newa Mashika. So every single word, the ancient, medieval. So basically, the Newa identity, and that identity can be extended to literature and also the art. So art can be subdivided into architecture, painting, and sculpture, and then music. And then history could be ancient history, medieval history, and modern history. And also literature could be the language, uh, I and mean, uh, literature, and also the lippi. So the culture could be you know, festivals and traditions and rituals. All this is about the Inewa identity. So that's what you know, I presented this many, many uh, you know, conferences. I also have this is my thesis uh, submitted. Uh, definitely it's not on the way, to, it's, it's on the way to publication, but it may take some time to you know, finish up everything. Uh, World New Organization, so that was from Kathmandu. I think Supriya already know about that. You were there at the time, you were doing the presentation at it. Uh, so I also published the Journal of New York Studies in uh, 1997. So all the journals are uploaded in Cambridge University. Uh, Cambridge University digital Himalaya.com from one to seven is already there. I'm working on the eight one, but uh, it's not even done yet. So sorry, I put the wrong picture over here. So I don't want to show that. <laughs> so I'm also the president of the Nepal Association of Oregon. So uh, I'm leading uh, this year for 2021 and 23. So hopefully uh, there are a lot of you know people from Nepal they came to visit uh, Kagindra Luitel and also uh, I INS president at the time came to Oregon. Uh, okay, so the, most of the people we in Oregon we uh, celebrate the Mahapuja, and when we celebrate Mahapuja, and that's how we dress up. Uh, this is about the language of the uh, Newar language. So I draw this picture a long time ago. So Newar language has a feature borrowed from Kiran and also from the Bodhis Himalayas. So most of the Bodhis Himalayan languages has a Tamang, Gurung, Takali, and Magar. And then the, the, I put the two lines together from Bodhis and also from Kiran. So the features from the Kiran language, and the Kiran languages are Limbu, Rai, and Sunwar. So the language spoken in the Dolaka region. So all the uh, all the features of you know Kiran language, uh, the leftover feature from Kiran language also use in Dolaka. So now from the Noir language, uh, most of the you know languages now these days, what we are talking about, the conjunct process, disjunct is like a self versus non-self and the past versus um, non-past. So these are available in these categories like uh, Kathmandu, Patan, Bhaktapur, Bandipur, Chitlang, Gopali, Gomali, Dulikhel, and Pangao, all these features are available. So I have studied the language of, of this area. And same way in the power agreement, power agreement in the Dolaka and also in the Pohari, so similar like in Nepali. So Hami Mo Kanchu, Tapai Kanu Hunsa, or Hami Hami Kanchu. So this kind of a structural, power uh, structural change available in the power agreement system. Only in Dolaka and Pohari uh, we have found it, but all others are available in the content system. The content system means a speaker process error or self process non self. -error. These are all. Anyway, I have traveled in this area and then you know, analyze everything itself. So that's I, yes, what? I have a question about this particular slide. Um, at the time, to Newar, the guy, to a certain war, Johnny, right? So there are arrows coming from Buddhist and Kirat. So I just wanted to know if it's possible to like get a clear idea of like what exactly is the Buddhist component that is there in Nepal Vasa and what is the Kirat component that is in Nepal Vasa? Is, are there some examples that would illuminate that better? Yeah, yeah. So the Kirat component right now, not available in this Kathmandu dialect, but it is still there in a Dolakha dialect. Dolakha Such dialect. as like, what, what, what would that be? Like, like a sentence or a word, an example, what, what does that mean? Um, 
the structure in a bhar are different, not like jin naya and then chan nala, but in Dwalka dialect, jin has a different one, cha has a different one, and wa has a different one, just like in Nepali. That's the left row. In Kurat language, like Limbo, Rai, and Shunwar, there are 108, 28 different kinds of bar endings. 128 different kinds of bar endings in Kirat language. So those are all in the left row. That's why the, sometimes people say the Newars are Kirat also. The Yelumbar is from Kirat. So that's what you know. There's also some structural, you know, a linguistic uh, structure different. So only, in also in the Pahari language, I also found the one uh, I something and you something and then they or he something. So those are the leftover. But whereas in the Tamang Gurung and Thakali language, uh, it's very similar. If, we, if you analyze the verb structure of Tamang Gurung, Thakali, and Magar, it's very similar with the discourse, conjunct distant category of the verb. Very similar over there. So that's why the Buddhist, uh, this category of the Buddhist and West Himalayas and East Himalayas was uh, categorized by George in, uh, uh, Harry, so what is that? The Linguistic Survey of India, the book written by Gerson. Gerson, it was analyzed in the early 19, uh, 1900. So they categorized into all different languages. So mostly this whole thing is from the, uh, the you know, Tibeto-Burman languages. So Tibeto-Burman language starting from Tibet also all the way to Burma. So all the languages spoken in that region is, uh, into together as a tibeto burman language. So tibeto burman language came from the Sino-Tibetan language. Sino-Tibetan is the one of the biggest umbrella. Uh, all the languages, Korean and Japanese and Thai and all the languages are coming into together. But this one particularly for the South Asian and also is Himalayan language. So that's why it, uh, we put, put together in a one category in like a, in a tibeto burman language. Uh, see, I think, okay, that's all about what I did and how I'm doing, and then I'm teaching Nepali and also the Newar language in online and also in the uh, community colleges. If you would like to know more about myself, so I have a website, uh, iti-service.net, www.iti-service.net. You can find more work I have done in my past and also, you know, learning classes and everything. So, this is a special you know, the request for Nandita. If anybody wants to know this language from Darjeeling, please, you are the torch bearer for it. Because now you are here, now you know that being born in uh, Kalimpong and then I'm still speaking and I'm still teaching, I'm living in the United States. So I'm teaching the Newar language to the American people and also for you know, uh, people who are outside Nepal. So this is my pride of being a Newar and teaching the language. Okay, so that's all I have. So, so I'm, I didn't hear anything from Anrup uh, Ji. So Anrup Ji, would you like to say something? Because uh, I didn't hear your voice yet. So. How do you like about that? What do you? What is the taking takeaway from this class? Uh, my, my major takeaway is understanding how the origin of language has been, which which I have been very curious ever since the beginning of of uh, this course, um, and then also understanding how the uh, structure is very rooted in logic, which Vishnu sir kept mentioning. Uh, I was also trying to understand it, but this this uh, uh, session really uh, connects all of that together. Um, more than that, it in, intrigues a curiosity into understanding uh, uh, the, 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 the major structure and, and the linguistic elements of it, which I think I will do by uh, reading few reports or something on in research. But yeah, it, it makes me really curious. If you look at the uh, digitalhimalaya.com website uh, loaded in the Cambridge University, and I have in, in one of the uh, journal, uh, I have listed more than 200 uh, the thesis is written on Nepal Vasa. Uh, I have listed the bibliography of all the, you know, you will be able to, you know, make access to all those, you know, materials, and then you can have the help from somebody who speak both languages, Nepali or Niwa and also Nepali, uh, Nepal was our English, so you can do some lots of research work. So only request to all of you that since you are here with me and then let's make Nepal language because the UNESCO has already 
uh, already listed Nepalwasa as an endangered language. We don't want to see that my grandchildren, you know, say I don't speak at all. Okay? My grandmother used to speak. Nandita might say that, oh, sorry, my grandmother, my someone who is used to speak, but now I don't speak anymore because we live in Darjeeling. And then all the Darjeeling people in Darjeeling, they don't use your last name like a Shakya or two other, so all are Pradhan. I remember the Ganga Prasad Pradhan when I wrote the book, Kalimpong uh, Saite. So I have discovered so many things. Uh, Ganga Prasad Pradhan went from um, uh, Kathmandu, Tamil to, uh, you know, Darjeeling and then started speak, you know, teaching about uh, Christianity and then he became the Padri. So Padri, so that's what you know. it was. Before uh, the Gorkha Patra was published in 1901, in a similar same year that the Gorkha Prasad Pradhan started publishing the Gorkha Kavar Kagas in Darjeeling. I have all the history. I, yeah, I've written down all the history in my book. So I'm a man of literature and also the linguist. And also currently I'm working on the mental health side because how to uh, treat the people by using the linguistic therapy. So I'm using the linguistic word, linguistic uh, you know, methodology to uh, treat the people who are going through the mental uh, disorder. Can you imagine that? This is my current you know, working. So I am a peer support specialist. Uh, and also work with the people who have some uh, understanding difficulties, mental disability, they have a behavioral difficulty. So I use my uh, linguistic um, uh, therapy for those people. So some people are very appreciated and definitely it is a new topic in a new discovery and a new innovation in the field of a mental disorder in you know, a therapy. So. This is who I'm seeing. So if I have spoken too much more than what you are expecting, so forget about it. Otherwise, this is who I am. Okay. So we can go with the switching from, uh, so switching from, uh, you know, uh, Nepali, Newa. Why we are called Newa? Because people of Nepal, our dozen people of Nepal, the India constitution already of Tarapar. Uh, Nepal was up on the middle of Nepal because why? Because this is the you know, this is the language of Nepal. We don't recognize the language of Nepal in Indian constitution, right? So, when I submitted my manuscript to Sikkim for the publication, and I submitted as a Nepal Vasa reader, but they changed that from Nepal Vasa to the Newa language, okay? So, this is a controversy, a political controversy. So Okay, uh, la, uh, final yeah. remark from Bishnuji. <laughs> if anybody has nothing to say, so I'm gonna uh, end the sir, you know. Sir, I've the shared time. a link in the chat. Could you confirm if that is the one? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, that's the one. Okay. And then you can go into digitalhimalay.com and go into journals and then Newa began. There's another category called Newa began. And also I have uploaded in my website also, www. Uh, itiservice.net. Yoko Yoko Subha. So, Josulopa Subha, and what else? I didn't teach you too much. I just give you some, you know, theoretical background. That's all, so that you will understand. So, La Nandita Jile or Dalingma Alika Halla Pita Dinu Pario. Kalimpongma, Poreko, America, Goyako, Nepal was a Shikau de Goreko. What a wonderful person, mother. What is this Tatamata? So I went to research going through the Tatamata and then I discover and then now I'm challenging anyone who is saying Tatamata in my language. Because I grew up in Kalimpong. Okay, Tanibad. Thank you so much, Bishnuji, and also Sadicha, and anyone who is in organizing this. I'm so happy that you are here. You think it will be very much interesting to all the uh, listeners. Uh, um, uh, you go somewhere. Hmm.